Okay, so here we go. So the topic of this discussion uh, is to address uh, the ADAPT homework system. Uh, I'll be bouncing back and forth between the term ADAPT and the term query for this discussion, uh, uh, query, uh, and I will explain the differences between the two uh, uh, as we go. So let's start uh, with a general overview again of uh, why faculty don't use OER. Um, and this was a study that came out in 2016 from the Babson Survey Research Group that identified a range of different barriers associated with the adoption of OER by faculty uh, in the country. Uh, and many, actually let me phrase that, all of these barriers are meant to be addressed by the LibreText project uh, in one way or another. Uh, and hopefully at, at this stage you can understand uh, how we built certain things in order to address each of these aspects that are on there. But the one aspect that we have not addressed uh, so far, although been discussed or hinted multiple times uh, is the um, is the lack of associated material uh, which essentially includes uh, a homework system in order to be able to accompany uh, our content um, so the <clears throat> the libreverse Right, this infrastructure that we are constructing, this ecosystem, um, is centered by the libraries, which is this wiki-based approach that we've been going through over the last few days, and a series of ancillary technologies in order to augment the utility and the power of the libraries into something a lot more powerful. Now, uh, it, it, each of them can be discussed in, in lots of detail, uh, and I would certainly love the time in order to go about doing it, but right now we're only going to be talking about these two boxes right here, um, the ADAPT homework system and the query homework system. Now, I mentioned that I'm going to be defining them, at least I'm going to give you a hint behind it, that ADAPT is used for summative homework and query is used for formative homework. Uh, uh, and again, we're going to uh, emphasize that uh, in a moment. So the question that we have here is, um, uh, we've been actually planning and gone through multiple steps in order to build a homework system for the LibreText uh, from its infancy when it was the Chem Wiki over 13 years ago. Uh, many of those have failed uh, for one reason or another. Um, and the question that pops up is why did it take so long for us to be able to implement the homework system? Because again, the LibreText project is formulated and built by faculty, by instructors. Uh, so it, we know what we feel we need because we are teaching with it and we know what we need for our specific classes. And that is a pretty good idea in order to extend across uh, all of academia. An a, separate, a difference would be if someone were to create the site that's not instructors and they oftentimes can go in a very different direction or not necessarily address these. And so the question that I have here is how do you build an online homework system that complements the utility of the LibreText infrastructure and is flexible, dynamic, comprehensive, integrated, uh, elements agnostic uh, uh, and powerful um, and the and free or nearly free uh, uh, off of there and the answer to that is essentially uh, that you don't recreate the wheel uh, you do it slowly uh, in, and efficiently in order to do that and that's what uh, we've gotten to today um, uh, after many years of uh, visualizing these things and starting to really uh, start the development of this homework system uh, at the beginning of the summer of last uh, year. Um, so the key point again is not to uh, reinvent the wheel in how we're going about doing it. So uh, the ADAPT homework system reflects a little bit of the uh, flexibility uh, uh, and I would say a little bit of the chaotic nature of how I think in terms of the overall LibreText project with all the different features in, uh, that you have available. And it's designed in order to be uh, used in a variety of ways. So some of the features and goals of ADAPT uh, includes the trying to reinforce both auto grading and open ended grading dual use. Uh, so in other words, we recognize uh, as instructors that there are questions that we can formulate within an existing infrastructure for auto grading capabilities um, so that we don't need to involve humans in order to be able to grade them. Many questions like multiple choice or adding in numbers or other sort of things are really well designed for, for doing that thing. But there are also many questions, especially in upper division and graduate level, where the questions require a human an open-ended set of questions in order to evaluate that. And obviously that doesn't involve the same sort of technology for auto grading, but the key point in order to establish a powerful homework system, we wanna be able to do and facilitate both effectively. And that's what we've actually done by using multiple technologies for auto grading and a very facilitated 
uh, open integrating infrastructure that helps instructors of record grade, or if you have TAs in order to be able to effectively go through grading uh, in a very paralyzed method out there. And I'll emphasize both of them um, that we have uh, here. So the second aspect of uh, what the ADAPT homework system is set for doing is to be able to be used using questions either formatively or summatively. That's where I was talking about ADAPT versus uh, query. And now there are better definitions of being able to uh, distinguish between the two, but the definition I'm going to be using in order to distinguish this is largely, is there a grade book that's meant in order to track that the student has evaluated or, or gone through a specific problem? Uh, uh, and implementing a grade book uh, is uh, immensely more complicated uh, for applying summative problems than it is for uh, formative problems because you need to have students log in, you need to be able to track who the student is, you need to have stability, you need to have FERPA rules to protect uh, the infrastructure, uh, and you need to go through all this stuff in order to make sure that there are no problems in order to be able to implement that out because it becomes a higher stake uh, issue with lots of people particularly interested in making sure that it's done right and well, while it's formative, has the opportunity of being a little clunkier um, and a little bit harder in order to implement because it's not graded. Uh, most people uh, and most students are quite uh, open or comfortable um, uh, with not criticizing um, the infrastructure behind the, the question and the pedagogy and using those questions. Um, lastly, uh, the ADAPT infrastructure is designed in order to be used in multiple use cases. Um, and that uh, that includes the numbering didn't work right here. We start with one. Um, the ability for people to go directly to or students as to uh, interface with their questions with the Adapt Homework System online with the website that we have available. Um, so if you go to adapt.libertex.org and you sign in as a student, just like what you are doing right now or have done uh, as a faculty member, uh, and that's how I personally use it most of the time. Uh, you can use it indirectly by actually embedding the summative questions into your textbook. So this is closer to what I refer to as a textbook of the future on Monday, basically trying to say we know that the textbook of the future involves engagement and involves technology. So basically start to transition from what exactly a textbook is from a merger of just content for you to master, but introduce interactivity like animations and cinema. Uh, simulations, or to also introduce interactivity in terms of assessments um, that they can do. So it becomes a workbook of sorts along with the content. And the idea behind that is that when you merge the two, you get the students e uh, interacting with the content at multiple times and at multiple levels. And the more the students interact with the content, uh, the greater the chance of them internalizing uh, the content uh, and ultimately learning from the content. Um, uh, and an example I'll be showing from that uh, will be uh, Brian Lynchfield's uh, uh, intermediate nutrition book from uh, Kansas State University, who's been working on, uh, has been using this mechanism for since the start of this, uh, this year. Uh, another mechanism, uh, and this is requested a lot, is learning management system integration. To be able to have ADAPT and being able to have it used in the learning management system itself. Now we, uh, pursue an agnostic uh, perspective of learning management systems. We don't want to be embedded into a learning management system, but we also recognize that by today's standards, we need to have some communication off of that. Uh, and there are different aspects of communication. One can be gradebook communication, uh, so that when the actual students uh, uh, um, submit their answers to our gradebook, then that can go directly to a learning management system gradebook. The second level, uh, which is the ability in order to take the questions as uh, individual components and embed them into the quizzing infrastructure of your learning management system. So you don't even have to know that there's anything out there called an ADAPT. It's just basically an option available for um, faculty to use. Um, the first one we have established, the second one we are not quite there yet, um, but we are working on that and it's one of our top priorities out there. Lastly, uh, in terms of uh, use cases that we were particularly interested in pushing is classroom usage. Um, so if you teach a large class, 
um, and many of my classes oftentimes exceeds 300, 400 students, uh, you want to have a mechanism to engage with the students and you can use ADAPT as a clicker system. It's a bring your own device clicker system uh, where they can pull out their phone and you can uh, give them questions uh, in your PowerPoint slides or access it through uh, ADAPT and they can answer the questions using their clickers or uh, on a website. And from that mechanism then enhance your interactivity with the students and there's lots of justification with that right there that enhances uh, learning. Uh, it certainly makes the conversation and the presentation that is far more palatable for uh, sitting through when it's more active off of that. Now, uh, <clears throat> we have the ability in order to do that right now using the H5P uh, problem sets, although the other technologies we use should be available, but they're typically a little bit more overkill, more sophisticated problems than what you would typically give in class because you don't want to use classroom activities for doing hardcore um, uh, calculations and such, at least I don't. So again, I mentioned uh, query and I mentioned uh, adapt. So query is the term that we use again for uh, addressing formative questions. Um, we have a library called the query.libretext.org library uh, that you can access and you can see these questions that are all accumulated. And the idea behind that is that we use multiple technologies and when we want to accumulate the questions into a single database uh, in order to be able to search and go through the infrastructure. And that's what Curry is desi designed for. However, we are starting to transition away from using the query database and starting to use the ADAPT database directly. Uh, and there may be a time where we completely remove the query database database for being able to find content. The query database is publicly viewable. You can go through that. You can start to use it. All the questions are formative. It has 100,000 questions from multiple technologies that are there. Complementing the query database is the Libra Studio, uh, which you have accounts to where you can go through and see the collection of one specific type of technology, H5P. Now, uh, <clears throat> so it provides a centralized location for community assets. Uh, you can then uh, search through and find problems. You can close problems off so they're faculty only, um, uh, and they can be directly embedded into your textbook pages, but they're embedded formatively. So there's no grade book. Any student can, and when they look at the page, can then be able to interact with the problem, submit the problem and evaluate or get, get feedback if the problem is correct or not. Uh, the ADAPT system, which again is immensely more complicated in order to establish, uh, it then provides the opportunity for summative or keeping track of the uh, individual students. And like I mentioned, uh, it has both auto-graded and open-ended questions. Uh, what I'll be mentioning later on uh, in the in today is the, the adaptive learning component. So the ability in order to build adaptive trees or learning trees uh, in order to provide a greater learning experience than what a traditional problem homework set uh, would provide. Uh, and we are also using ADAPT in order to be able to address culturally responsive pedagogy and learning. Um, and I'll only provide a, an example of what we're mocking up for doing that, but it's not uh, available right now for uh, use in that matter. Uh, and I already mentioned a few additional things associated with that. Uh, one of the benefits of having this thing centralized uh, is the ability in order to do learning analytics. Uh, so you can identify how students interact with the material. Uh, and then from that information, use that to guide um, uh, guide pedagogy um, and uh, efficacy of what has been created. Uh, we also use this thing, and I, I mentioned this before, uh, for not just homework or quizzing, but uh, I, I use it for laboratories. Uh, uh, I use it for exam, well, I mentioned exams. Uh, I, I use it for the clicker-based uh, systems, uh, and I'll show you uh, my general chemistry class, which has uh, numerous uh, examples of various things that I, I go about doing it. I use it in lieu of most of my learning management systems. Uh, however, I'm a little more aggressive than many other people in, in doing that, uh, in part because of my aversion to learning management systems, which is my personal philosophy. Okay, so I want to uh, go through a little bit of philosophy behind how we actually built this and why we built it. So you can actually understand why uh, it was built and the utility of why it was built in this way. Um, and the idea behind that is if you, is again, if you're gonna recreate the wheel, uh, you need to have a mechanism in order to try to address how content is used uh, in a variety of different ways. So for example, uh, if you have a series of stakeholders, of faculty and students that are using material uh, off of this thing, and a series of materials. I'm just going to use this as OER resources because this is how the LibreText project uh, operates. I'll get rid of this thing. 
Um, and you can imagine, well, where are the type of interactions that are involved in this? So this is part of this fragmentation aspect that I feel is plaguing the, uh, the OER uh, universe. So this content distributed in a variety of different places. Uh, uh, and it's difficult in order to be able to find content uh, uh, or more specifically, even finding specific aspects of content, like what we were talking about before, irrespective of books that might be able to, to host that content. It's distributed in a variety of different formats uh, and it's difficult in order to be able to use them and, and enter uh, in, uh, in a very integrated fashion. Uh, and that's why uh, we, um, we built the LibreText project or as a library to act as what's called a, a, an abstraction layer. It's not exactly the formal definition of abstraction layer, but the key point is to provide a central infrastructure so that all the complexity of the OER ecosystem and finding things fragmented in various spots can be uh, simplified by bringing it into this, uh, this abstraction layer, this repository uh, of sorts, uh, so that students know uh, and stakeholders like faculty are able to access it directly and you don't need to worry about these core uh, overall issues. That's again, if we've harvested the content properly, although like Sarah mentioned, we oftentimes are not 100% on top of the harvesting because we're going through so much content so quickly. So this underlies the success of the LibreText project. Uh, it, uh, I'm committed to the sort of approach in order to be able to do things. And you can apply the sort of approach to um, uh, homework also. So the key point here, and I want to define what the different aspects of, of uh, resources is within the homework system, is different technologies in order to be able to implement them. Um, so I'm going to talk about the auto grading specifically, but I'll be showing you the, uh, the uh, open ended grading. Uh, uh, so we have three different technologies that we have embedded or used within ADAPT. Now, uh, one is web work, which is one of the first uh, open source online in this uh, uh, homework system. It, it originated back in uh, 1995, uh, form, it formed initially by Mike Gage, back when the web was a very hot term. So hence the term web and web work in order to be able to get that uh, out there. Uh, it's a powerful system, exceedingly powerful system in order to be a handle, in, in order to handle algorithmic based questioning. Uh, 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 it's server side evaluations, which means you need a secondary server in order to evaluate uh, these things. Uh, you, and you can look at their uh, more details on this webwork.maa.org. The second system that we have in place is IMath AS. Uh, IMath AS is the technology underlying MyOpenMath. If you're in Washington State, it's WAMAP. Uh, 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 or if you've ever had any familiarity with uh, Lumen's OM system, that's basically IMath AS. It's open source technology that you can then implement and use effectively. It was a port of web work that restructured things in order to be used in a slightly different fashion, uh, in part because of the complexities in terms of being able to both program content and to use this content effectively in courses. Uh, and you can see more information regarding IMath in this uh, URL right here. The last technology that we have integrated into ADAPT is H5P. Um, and again, that was discussed several times earlier this, uh, in this workshop. And you have access to the Libra Studio, which is our repository of H5P problems. H5P is empowered by HTML5. Um, so it's the ability in order to really enhance the utility of modern web programming uh, in order to be able to provide um, these things. And it, it originates from a, a company in, uh, Northern uh, Norway, um, and it's a very beautiful technology and simple technology in order to build questions. But those questions are far less uh, sophisticated than what web work and IMath A has. It doesn't have nearly the algorithmic control or the flexibility uh, behind that. Uh, and that's largely because that the technology underlying any question is essentially a program. You write a program. So the program for web work is written in Perl which is not a language that many people have mastered. Uh, the programming language in IMath AS for the code is PHP, which is also not a common language that many people have mastered currently. And the language behind H5P, I don't even know what it is because it's a graphical interface in order to be able to build uh, and, and run that. Um, and don't even need to know about doing that. The one thing I'll mention that, that this is server-side evaluation. So we need a server in order to evaluate the responses of the students. This is this is the same server side. This one here is client side, which means that you can download um, when you run this uh, an H5P problem, you're evaluating it on your computer, not on our computer. Now, the reason I point this out uh, is that that means that there is potential security issues uh, associated with H5P. Um, so that's possible to easily hack into a problem of H5P. 
So if you use H5P, my strong recommendation is not to use it for high stakes scenario uh, because students can and do hack into it. Uh, for example, if this were a class a computer science class at MIT, if they were to use H5P problems for their exams, uh, within five minutes, everybody in the class would get 100% uh, on their exams. Uh, so it's relatively easy in order to be able to hack into it. And you can do that in a couple minutes if you know what you're doing. So just be aware of that in terms of that. So H5P is most ideal for formative, is really good for clicker-based systems, um, um, but for high stakes scenarios, you don't wanna use it. You wanna use some of the more powerful um, uh, technologies that have better security off of that. The exception to that is if you actually pay H5P money and they'll give you a, a server-side uh, uh, instance in order to be able to embed into your learning management system. Uh, but that can oftentimes be quite pricey. Um, there are other uh, technologies that we are reviewing in order to be able to bring into our system. I already mentioned Clicker. I'm going to skip over that. The Jupyter Homework System, sorry, the Jupyter um, Hub infrastructure that lets us embed executable code. For example, we can embed Python or R or Octave, which is a MATLAB alternative, directly into the book in order to build this textbook of the future. That has a grading infrastructure, so you can actually code and then evaluate if that code is correct. Um, we have not embedded that into ADAPT, but it's part of our Jupyter uh, Hub instance. Um, we have been working on making spreadsheets available so that you can actually interface problems with spreadsheets. If you're in accounting, that's particularly important. Uh, and then we have started to go through the infrastructure and building an organic chemistry infrastructure. Uh, in a module into our system. So you can start to build molecules and then evaluate if those molecules are correct for the reaction that we have uh, out there. We're at the initial stages of that um, and we're gonna slowly move forward, uh, but uh, we're very uh, excited about the prospect of being able to do that because that then provides a very comprehensive perspective or comprehensive use of uh, ADAPT across uh, chemistry. Um, so, okay. So, uh, and I'm almost done with the philosophy before we get into the nitty gritty details of ADOPT. Uh, any homework system, uh, any of those three technologies out there has the same sort of fundamental components in order to be able to use effectively. Um, so uh, for example, in web work, you need a problem builder, you need a problem library, you need a problem searcher, you need a pro a sense, a assessment delivery infrastructure, assessment checker, a grade book, uh, a, a learning management system, fine. IMATH AS needs the same set. H5P needs the same set. Every single technology uh, for auto grading has the same set of uh, things that are necessary for it. And each one of them is different. Uh, uh, some are more powerful than others. Some are more easier to use than others, but they're each different in order to be able to implement. So when you want to transition or use one technology and then go to another technology, you have a barrier. And sometimes that barrier can be really quite uh, big in order to be able to master off of that. What we are doing is taking these different technologies, which have their native components off of them, uh, and stripping them away uh, into certain components of that, for example, building a centralized problem library, like the, the query system, remove the problem search and have a centralized search capability, independent of the technology that we have, where you're looking at a specific uh, you're looking for a specific question. You don't care about what the technology is. Uh, drop the gradebook and have a centralized gradebook infrastructure and a centralized learning management system. So the key point is to make this overlay that is centralized and identical irrespective of the technologies that you use. Still have the technologies do the stuff that they are well designed for doing, which is to deliver a problem and evaluate the problem. But all the other stuff we don't care about. So then when we actually improve the interface in order to handle one a problem uh, type, it then is useful across the board. Uh, and everyone then benefits from that approach instead of having to replicate that, uh, that infrastructure. Um, the other approach I should mention here is that no one technology is ideal for every single field out there. Um, so instead of trying to master multiple fields or multiple uh, technologies for dealing with multiple fields, uh, uh, what we're trying to do is to make it so the interface is the same across the board and we just have it modular. So we put in different technologies and we do all the stuff back on the back end. So the front end faculty don't need to deal with the pain about associated with is this a web work problem? Is this an IMATH uh, AS problem? Is it an H5P problem? Who cares? It still has the same capabilities. So. Oh. This is a, uh, uh, and I, I'm not trying to scare you uh, with this, uh, this overstructure, uh, uh, but it, it, it gives you a perspective of how these things are, um, are put in place on a layered approach. So underlying all, uh, each of our technologies has its own server. 
that's running with that. Uh, the H5P server is that uh, Libra Studio that you now have account uh, in order to store the stuff. There's IMAP AS and WebWork, which you don't have accounts on, um, but if you're interested, we can go about uh, working with that. Uh, we have uh, lots of people working on making problems in order to make this library as expansive as possible uh, across the board. So these technologies uh, are uh, tabulated in the query system as a library for formative use that you can then pull into. Those questions can go uh, then through ADAPT where you have the gradebook infrastructure on top of it. And then you can embed that directly into your textbook. You can also embed it, uh, the query problems directly in your textbook, but that'll be formative instead of summative. And the ADAPT can then interface to the learning management system or through the textbook embedded as modules into the learning management system that's there. So this is a layer cake of sorts in order to be able to establish these sort of things. So it's not one application, actually ADAPT is about seven different applications and databases running simultaneously. You know? So it's not the sort of thing that you can take and download on your site. Moreover, we've also implemented this on uh, uh, Amazon Lambda infrastructure to handle scalability uh, because uh, as many people or as students start to access this, a single server starts to get loaded down and we want to make it to be able to be up and available uh, and rapidly used for everybody uh, that wants to be able to utilize that. Unfortunately, that then requires some sort of financial or sustainability model in order to maintain this infrastructure in contrast to conventional OER uh, where you can give a PDF out um, or if you store it on a platform like a Libre Text or Pressbooks or such, you have uh, you typically have to have some sort of infrastructure to maintain it uh, and keep it afloat. And that's a business model, or in our case, a sustainability model, because we're a not for profit organization. So that is the end of the overview uh, and the topical understanding of how ADAPT is structured. So that when I talk about various things, you can understand them and the terminology that's there. Now we're going to transition into um, the actual ADAPT website and start to move forward with that. Um, so let's do that. I'm going to close this thing off. Close this thing off. And does anyone have any problems accessing the uh, the uh, ADAPT homework system? Okay. So the ADAPT homework system was designed, is under construction uh, in order to be uh, as facilitated toward a very targeted goal. So in some perspectives, it's like a learning management system, but we don't have all the components that make a learning management system complicated. It's focusing only on assessments in the various cases that I talked about here. There are three types of accounts that we have currently. We have students, we have graders, and then we have instructors. Um, and you all have access to instructor accounts here. Um, and, and if uh, as students can register for an account here if they want, um, but if you don't have an access code for a specific class, it doesn't mean that they can do anything. In fact, they can't do anything uh, with, without an access code to a specific class. Uh, you can contact us uh, at the top here, and this is the login procedure, and it's relatively simple. We're gonna be um, modifying this front end a little bit to act more as a commons, so you can start to see the content and the collections that we have available. Uh, but right now it's relatively um, um, lacking in terms of de details that are out there. So let's log in. If you click under here, you have the option of logging in either directly with the account that you were that was created for you, uh, or you can even use the, the uh, campus login, which is that single sign-on login that you use in order to access the uh, LibreText. Contrast to the LibreText, which has either one or the other, ADAPT currently is set up in order to use either of them. So you can log in either way. I'm gonna log in uh, with my UC Davis account. Um, off of here and submit it. So here I am with my UC Davis account, my instructor account. Like I mentioned, I actually have three accounts. I have an instructor account, a grader account, and a student account because I want to be able to see and bounce back and forth behind that. That's not necessary, but it's not a bad idea in order to be able to do that, especially when you're building these sort of things. So once I've logged in, I then have access to being able to see all the courses that I have available. Now, I've been working on this for the last year, so I have a lot of things that I've been constructing. All of you will have nothing here, <laughs> and you'll only have an add course and an import course uh, that's there. Now, you'll also notice on the side here, this thing that says my courses. 
You click on it, it also says my learning trees. That's gonna be a topic at the advanced level in terms of building learning trees uh, for building adaptive learning on the case there. So what I would like you guys to be able to do is to build a course. Um, and that's the approach that we're doing here because it's a very simplistic uh, perspective on things. So you add a course, just add a course, and then you can get the specifications of the course that you have there. Uh, so uh, you don't necessarily have to specify the school, um, but you can uh, do a search through it. And uh, I'm going to make this uh, University of California Davis. I'm going to make this Chem 110B uh Statistics, StatMech, and I can't remember what I teach. Something. Uh, you know, I, I haven't taught this class in a year, in a decade. <laughs> so, uh, and then I have a public description. This is public, so it's the description that you use for people to be able to um, uh, uh, to identify this thing. You can, uh, yes, Sarah. You can delete everything. Um, so nothing is uh, is set up. Here, um, in fact, that little button right there, the trash can, is how you can delete uh, these things. Uh, so the public description is: this is a very special class, and the private description is the description that you would be able to, to have as you could think of it as annotations or notes uh, that you put together. Like, I really hate this class. Uh, which is all perfectly fine. And you don't need to worry about people being able to recognize it. And then you can say, um, Professor Crabtree does a better job than I do. Uh, uh, read his notes. Now this is useful because I have the ability if I wanna make this public, I can let other people copy or clone this book. And then they come in with the notes that says, you know, if you don't read my notes, go to, him, his notes are better than mine. I'm not sure if I agree with this, but if he ever hears this, he'll actually uh, at least uh, see that someone does that. Um, you have the ability to make sections up. Um, and so you can think of subsections in your class uh, that have different uh, rostering uh, infrastructure. Um, uh, in this case here, uh, I just type main. Uh, so it's, it's one class, one section on a class. Um, uh, CRN, if you have a course number that you have uh, that you know is associated with your campus, uh, that's there. Feel free to write down what type of term you have. This is just my my website. My my browser is auto loading it with various things that are not necessary. Uh, so I'm going to say the term is summer uh, 2021. I can give the start date, which I'll do there, and I give the end date. So this is a one week class, and public basically means other faculty can see your prop your uh, the tech your uh, your course. It does not mean that other students can see your course. Um, and more specifically, it means that they can, uh, that other faculty can clone your course. So you do this when you make a course and you want people to be able to use your course uh, out there. So I'm gonna keep it no, because this is not gonna be a very impressive course that I'm gonna be making for you right now. And I'm submitting it. And now I've made a class. Now, the infrastructure behind uh, the, the ADAPT is a three level system. You have courses. Uh, and below each course, you have uh, assignments of different types. And before e below each assignment is assessments, which are basically questions. That's it. It's a three level system uh, that we have in place. Uh, so there's no uh, complexity of hierarchies like what we were dealing with in making a book because that's the basic infrastructure behind these sort of uh, things. The aspect that comes in is what's the nature of the assessments and what's the nature of the assignments that hold those assessments because you have a bit of flexibility off of there. But most of the time you don't need to deal with lots of the complexities behind that depending upon what you're doing. So that is a book that we made. Let me show you uh, a book that is uh, more complicated so you can actually get an idea behind it. And we'll, we'll, uh, I'm going to use General Chemistry 3. So this is a third quarter General Chemistry class. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not going to be able to show you a grade book uh, or auto grading because that's going to show you real students because it hasn't been purged yet. Uh, we purge student information 100 days after the class is over in order to satisfy FERPA requirements. Um, but you can see that this infrastructure, this class, uh, it, it consists of many different assignments. So I have a series of labs, both pre-labs and post-labs that are part of the class. Uh, uh, and you can see the group is set up as a lab. So I actually can designate what the type of the group is. That's useful for 
uh, grading, the gradebook infrastructure. Uh, I have formative questions, um, and these questions one, two, three, and four, these are basically open stocks questions. So I've taken them, I pop them there, and I let the students use them formatively because they're oftentimes not um, at the level uh, that I like my classes uh, uh, to teach, to be taught. Uh, let me phrase that. It's not at the level that uh, I want students to, to uh, master for for exams on my class. Um, but they're practice, so they're basically formative. Uh, so you can turn it off so it doesn't connect to the grade book. Then I have discussions. And so these are worksheets. Right? And I have a requirement for students to submit the worksheets of their discussions. It doesn't have to be complete. It's basically graded by submission. Uh, it's not graded by completion or graded by um, by performance, um, but it's meant in order to facilitate um, activity. Um, and that is the pedagogy of my class. Uh, then I start to have homeworks and I have two types of homeworks in my class. I have homeworks that are due every week. Those are uh, uh, the equivalent of a problem set. And then I have homeworks doing, due every lecture, uh, except, for the, the, except for when a homework set is due. So one's a weekly homework, one's a lecture homework. And the philosophy behind there is that students should be always uh, interacting with their material. And oftentimes if, they don't, if they're not forced in order to do that, they will not do that. And I think that uh, is a detriment to their learning experience. So the lecture homework uh, consists of one or two problems. It's not meant to be onerous, whilst the, um, the weekly homeworks are 10 to 15 problems for them to go about doing them. Uh, uh, again, these problems can be open-ended or closed-ended. So when I use this for my quantum mechanics classes, many of the questions are, uh, are open-ended because they need to do more sophisticated thinking than what an auto grading capability is available for. That is intrinsically designed here so I can actually use it in, in irrespective of what the complexity of the class is, or if you're writing essays or lab reports or things like that, or even in some cases we have the ability, to, no, not some cases, we do have the ability to submit audio. So you can actually, if you're teaching a foreign language, you can start to have an interaction of that or like, or uh, music. Although I don't think the resolution is the, 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 um, um, the, the, the refresh rate the, uh, it is super high in order to be able to, to make Beethoven happy with what someone may submit. Okay, so I have weekly homeworks and then I have midterms. Uh, and this right here has the midterms that I've given uh, to the students. Uh, and then it also has the practice midterms. Uh, so once I put these up here, then when students say they actually want a past exam, I just click, 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 and then you have access to all the past exams and they can study to their heart's content. My philosophy is to give the students as many things for them to study so they get gummed down. And if they want to master it, they can do that, but they don't actually focus on one specific uh, problem set that they live in. That's my, my perspective. And that's again, practice because it's, it's not coupled to anything. And then I have extra credit. So I use this as a mechanism in order to facilitate uh, open pedagogy or the using of students in order to uh, build OER content. Uh, and that's something I'm, uh, is not a topic of this workshop, but I would love to be able to discuss that if anyone's interested in order to go about doing that. So let me show you an example of a problem that's in here. Let's take um, weekly homework eight. Weekly homework eight is an assignment. So it has a series of assessments and this is the assessments that are added into this assignment. Um, so it is dealing with nuclear chemistry, which was a very short topic uh, this past quarter semester my timing was all screwed up because of online. Uh, so I spent about a day and a half trying to teach them how to build thermonuclear bombs. I think I failed, which is probably a good thing. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, they had to get the basic principles of nuclear chemistry. So they have six questions on here. This is my view uh, as a faculty member. It's not the student's view. Uh, so I'm able to find a code. Every single question that we have has a code. Uh, it's a two-part code where the first part is the, the um, um, the assignment number. So this is assignment number 327. It's assigned, that assignment is in my class. No one else ever has a different, has a different assignment number uh, because it's mine, my precious. Then I have an assessment number, uh, which is what that, that specific question 102411 is connected to. And that could be used in a variety of different uh, people's uh, home homework system because you can use the same problem in a variety of different variety of different people, but they would then obviously have different assignments because they would be using it in a different course. 
which is perfectly fine. Uh, and that gives us the ability to update that if we need to so that everyone can benefit uh, from that aspect. This tells me the technology that's being used. And so this question here, which I still have not shown it to you, is using WebWork. Um, I've selected this as 10 points. I have provided a PDF of the solution. I may not necessarily, I could decide when I want to show this to students. Uh, of it. And uh, my solutions tend to be as extensive as possible. So I'd like my solutions to be like a page to a page and a half. So it's meant to be walking them through every single step that's involved in here, not just basically here's the answer. Now, uh, and that takes some time. I have the ability to edit. Uh, if I, did I press the right button? Uh, actually, oh, no, I don't want to do it. Okay. Sorry, I'm stepping over. I have the ability to delete these things. I have the ability to reorder them by dragging and dropping uh, there. So if I want to have that set up there, and this is the link that uh, the title of the uh, page of it. So every page, every question we have right now is stored on our servers, but we have an abstraction layer where you can you store every question on a page on the Libra textbook. It's linked to the content on there, but that provides a mechanism for us to add the PD uh, to write the solutions that we want on a page using the same editing capabilities that you have with math and, and all the stuff that you, you want to do. Uh, and then it's connected directly to that question. So it's not a separate PDF stored somewhere that else that you then get lost off of that. So I will, uh, and I'll show you what this, this is the page that hosts that question. Um, uh, so it has the question right here, um, which is auto grading. Uh, and right now it's not important I'll focus that. And then I have the solutions right here, which is not as expansive as I would have liked. Um, for here, but I would like to be able to do that. So if I go in here and I edit this page uh, using the same editing rights, I can then go in and start to do some exposition, say, and make sure you balance your neutrons and balance your protons and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and, and start to flesh it out uh, with more detail. Um, and, and I have students helping me doing that because they're really good at, uh, at being very verbose uh, in writing um, solutions down because they, they know all the little things that they trip on. Uh, in order to be able to do that. Then it needs cleaning up by doing that. So anyways, let's go to a problem. And here's that same problem that's uh, viewed through uh, through this thing. I'm having some issue here, which I need to take a look and find out why it didn't render, uh, even though it rendered here. Um, uh, and I will fix that uh, momentarily. But you see this, let me see, is there one here? Okay, this one came up, uh, which is the next, next question. Now, here's the question that's loaded here. Uh, and this is writing balanced equations and a few other issues associated with that. Here's the PDF. Uh, because I've given these problems, I then get real-time statistics uh, uh, of how the students are performing on here and saying, yes, uh, eight out of 10 students get this right. It's a decent question. It doesn't need significant perturbation in order to be able to be useful. Uh, and and this, this is all just standard statistics off of here. I have the ability to edit the, the, the question source. That's the same page that we have on here. Uh, and what you can see is that this right here has the problem that we have on the top here that uses web work. And then I have the solution page. This is in a conditional content uh, block. You have access to this on your pages. It's just basically saying who can actually view the stuff inside here. And right now, only developers can view the stuff inside here. So it gives me the ability to make a little hidden block that I can start to write these various things. But when I actually, because I'm a developer, I can then look at and see this thing, and I can then print this up as a PDF. And that's the PDF that I actually load uh, onto this one. We can make that automatic. I just haven't done it yet. Um, so again, this provides opportunity of, of making this long exposition of solutions bound directly to this thing. Amber, can you give me an update on, on timing and when I'm supposed to be stopping and we, we start to transition into something, uh, into the work uh, group? Right about now, you're supposed to stop and transition into breakouts, okay. but I don't know if we want I don't to. Think, I, don't, I don't want to do that yet. Uh, and and okay. we, we will uh, we'll step into it. I just want to get a rough idea about the timing. Um, okay. Okay, uh, so that's a, a, a simplified approach. Uh, there's a few additional buttons here that can be uh, a little awkward. You can add questions on here, which I'll be going to uh, in a moment. Uh, you can look at properties of that question. You can make a private description, which again would be something like Professor Crabtree uh, uh, does like this problem. 
hopefully he will never hear me using his name in vain. Uh, and that's saved and that's only viewed for me. So you can provide a commentation that says, you know, uh, you know, mm, students uh, uh, have a problem with uh, D because um, if they don't, what was B? Don't uh, have not mastered kinetics or something like that uh, and provides a mechanism for the grader for the student that uh, for the faculty member that adopts these things to understand some of the discussions behind the nature of that question um so uh the share gives the ability in order to give the information regarding various codes uh off of here um uh, you can actually give out a full url code and and just share it with a student and just say here it is, here's your problem. And they go and there's a problem. Uh, and, and so you don't need to use it directly on our site. You can, if you're familiar with uh, uh, HTML, you can actually embed this problem directly in a page. Now you can embed it on a LibreText page, but you can embed it anywhere. Now, in order to access it, you need to have permission as a student. So they need to log in in some way in order to be able to, which will pop up when you, when you uh, when you embed it. But nonetheless, it gives you the flexibility to use ADAPT in different ways than what we have, uh, how we've envisioned here. Um, uh, and then here's a link that goes to the source page uh, that uh, you can use in order to uh, edit the uh, the technology uh, that's that's there. Um, this right here is written again in, in web work uh, and web work requires the code in Perl and Perl is a programming language that we're not going to be discussing uh, here. But the key point is that once it's created, it's in the repository that you then have access to being able to pull. If you have questions yourself that you want to contribute to the repository, then you can contribute to it and we can actually uh, embed it so you can actually use it effectively and more importantly, so the greater community can actually start to use it effectively. Keep in mind that the questions are still uh, available only for students that are embedded in uh, that are enrolled in that class. Uh, so therefore, uh, even if you have it into our repository and, and faculty uh, with appropriate credentials, that even if you have a question that you embed into here for people to use, students are, it doesn't compromise the integrity of the students' uh, questions. That being said, a lot of questions that are in our repository. Uh, are available on other sites. For example, the OpenStax questions, many of them are available with uh, solutions or answers that are down that are written there. So they're not great for use as summative for, or let me phrase it, not great uh, for uh, high stakes use, but they're great for formative, uh, great as a learning tool in order to be able to do that. Um, and the, it's like every odd question. So we will have a metric offer to say this question is publicly available use it at your your risk because if you google it you will find it and we'll probably do that although we're not entirely sure how to go about doing that when we start to see compromised questions on chegg or in course heroes and such and that's impossible for us to avoid because there are thousands if not hundreds of thousands of faculty that are you know grumbling under our uh, our teeth when we actually see what what they post on there um Okay, so uh, that is just one uh, infrastructure that's available. Let me get rid of that. Uh, uh, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's go through a step of uh, adding something to your course. Um, so you have a course, that's the new course that we have right there. Uh, and it doesn't look overly impressive because it doesn't have anything in there. So we wanna add an assignment uh, to that course. Uh, so make a new assignment. Um, and this gives you a pop-up window that doesn't look terribly dissimilar to the pop-up that or, or the modal that we had for making the course with some credentials off of that. And we're gonna call this assignment uh, number one. Uh, and this is my very special uh, problem set. And then you say, I really hate this problem set. Again, one's public and one's private uh, for keeping your note uh, your notes out there. You can then select what type of um, 
uh, assignment group that's on there. That's important for the uh, gradebook infrastructure because the gradebook acts just like the same gradebook that you would have in your learning management system. So you can start to uh, have percentages and identify how they are contributed to an overall score um, and then even assign a grade uh, for that. It, it will generate Z scores because that's how I like to teach students uh, in classes is to is instead of start talking about statistics, uh, talking going further than just average and standard deviations, but Z scores as a metric for them to know where they're at compared to other things. And by teaching them this, it makes it much easier for them to understand how grades are actually uh, distributed in large classes. So I'm gonna make this a, a homework problem. Uh, I, I'm gonna keep it internal. I have the ability in order to uh, use this, like, for example, if you do a field group, a field survey or some, some other external information that uh, uh, you may want to write in here that has nothing to do with our infrastructure. That's part of the gradebook stuff. You can decide if you want performance or completion. This will have submission as a third option for scoring. So performance is out there. This is default points per question. It's You can modify this per question that you put in there uh, if you want. And here is where the complexity happens. Because we have different types of assignments, um, uh, we have different uses of interacting with the assessments that are in the assignments. So you can decide that the questions that are in, in this assignment are used as a, uh, a clicker assignment. You can have them as a learning tree assignment, which I'll be talking about uh, later on. Uh, as a delayed grading assignment, that basically means that they are submitting their grades, but they don't get feedback to say that they got it right or wrong. Um, and that's how I like to have many of my questions uh, in place because um, students that get question get instant response oftentimes don't go through the pain and the learning associated with the pain of asking, is this question right? Is this question right uh, 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 out there? Because many of the more formative feedbacks, I think, are atrophying our uh, students' study habits. And then you have real-time grading, which gives the ability in order for them to submit a question and get the response back. So you can bounce back and forth behind that. I'm just going to select delayed grading that's off here. Now I have the ability uh, of delayed grading. If it happens to be a open-ended delayed grading, uh, so I may ask them to write an essay, for example. Um, I, can, I can then select how they want to upload it. They can upload their answers as PDFs. They can upload their uh, answers as um, Um, as uh, individual uh, responses so they can actually type into a, a box uh, and such, uh, or uh, they can actually do, okay, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I'm off track of what this, uh, what this mode is. This is a different story. Let, let me step back here. Um, when you have an exam uh, or any assignment, uh, if the assignment requires open-ended submissions, like a PDF or a collection of PDFs, so let's say you took an exam and you want the students to write everything out, and then you want them to upload the PDF. They can upload a single PDF, but that's painful to grade. Uh, if you have 100 students and 100 problems, you want them to be cut up so each page is associated with each problem so you can actually quickly, with open integrating, cycle through and go to the problem really effectively and not have to cycle through and find, well, where's the question and how it's done. This is, provides a mechanism in order to facilitate that where uh, you can make them submit a single PDF. Um, you can have them submit individual PDFs for each question, or you can have them do both. Uh, or, or do either of those, those things. Then we have a submission uh, type where they can either submit a file for a specific question um, uh, or they can submit um, uh, none, basically meaning that uh, it's gonna be only auto graded. Yeah. And then you have a late policy. Um, so let's, just, let's assume that we do not wanna do it late, but if you do it except late, then you can start to have uh, different uh, deductions and how, when you want deductions to be done and, and, and a bunch of complexities associated with that. Let's just do it for uh, do not accept late because it's a detail that's not important for this uh, conversation. Um, it, I have the ability in order to make it summative or formative where formative, I just decouple it from the grade. So uh, that's out there. I can write instructions to students, uh, do these problems. Uh, um, now I have the ability to randomize. So I can actually make an assignment with 20 problems and I can Asked ADAPT to give three problems or five problems to the students randomly from the pool. 
So the pool problems out there. That's useful in order to provide some sort of flexibility so that not every student gets the same question, um, which then hinders uh, lack of integrity uh, around the questioning when students talk to each other behind that. Each question does have the ability to also have algorithmic control in the question but these are of the questions themselves that you've given us. So it's a different level off of there. Uh, notifications basically says that uh, uh, will students get a reminder that a homework is due? Uh, and if they do, the students get to select if they want the reminder 24 hours, 12 hours, um, six hours, one hour before the exam. I haven't given a three minute the warning before the exam is done. Um, <clears throat> uh, but when we do give dates out, we give dates and time. And it's very specific on that time is when it actually opens and closes and it's actually set up there, which makes it much easier, um, at least for me, uh, for dealing with late uh, submissions. Because uh, when I do it in class, they dri dribble in and it becomes really sort of awkward in terms of when they submit at different times and such. Um, yeah, I can assign it to a different group. Um, so if I have sections, I can then assign a, a one problem to one section, another problem to a different section, or I can make it to everybody in the class um, off of there. And then I can say, when is the problem set open and when is it closed? So I'm going to make it open tomorrow at uh, 9 uh, a.m. my time whatever the time that I have set here. Uh, and then I can say it's closed at 28 at, you know, in the morning uh, and then uh, such. I have the ability in order to over uh, overcome these things and introduce uh, uh, individual assignment uh, dates. This is useful for students that need delayed time, uh, special accommodations that, and other issues that need to be addressed on an individual basis. So I can say a specific student in this class, which I don't have written down here because I have no one enrolled in this class right now. Uh, uh, so I'm going to remove that assignment uh, off of here. So you just have one basically and it's set up for everybody and then I submit it uh, and now I have an assignment. So hopefully you've gone through that on your course uh, and that you've gone, uh, you now have an assignment. You can duplicate that multiple times. Um, uh, I will, uh, is, is this sort of approach uh, the best way I think for you guys, for me to go through and you're doing it on your side instead of letting you go, uh, go running free, like little bunny rabbits in a field. Uh, okay, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to assume that this is the, uh, this, this works well for both you guys and, and we'll do this instead of trying to let you, uh, I'll give you some free time near the end, but I want to kind of slowly step you through here. Fine. Okay. Now here's an assignment and I have a, a few features or content associated with the assignment meta tags on how to use it. Um, so it tells me it's in, uh, it's in the work group. It's available on this date and this date. So when the student comes in right now, they can see that there's an assignment due. There's an assignment, but they can't access it. Um, um, it, it so basically that means it's upcoming. Uh, it gives me a notification and I have some information here that's important. Uh, this is for graders. Uh, if you want to do the facilitated grading, uh, which I'll be showing to you, uh, assignment properties, which I already talked about. Um, this is sort of cloning and this is delete. And this right here is a circuit breaker. This right here is automatic. If you click this off here, it's like a student doesn't know it exists period. So it's not uncommon, and this is how I go about doing it, is I have uh, the available date from the start of the class, and I decide when I actually want to uh, let the students have access to it there, and I don't even ignore that, and it's only the due date that matters. That's how I go about doing it. Uh, uh, in other cases, for example, for exams, I set these things up days before. Students know that they can see on their roster, oh, there's an exam. It's on this date, it's this time. They rem they're reminded every time they do homework that there's an exam that's going to be due here, but they can't really do, they can't really look into those, de those details. Uh, you click on this again, you see all of the details that are associated with it. You can update it that's there. And that's a dashboard of sorts for uh, faculty uh, for accessing these things. And then you can click on here and now we have this empty assignment that has nothing there. I want to mention a few things on the side here that's of particular importance. You can get a summary in terms of uh, details. You just want to get a big picture of how you have this thing available. Um, uh, you know, who has assigned it when it's due, what it's type. Uh, uh, I'll talk about this thing in a, in a second. These are some statistics on how, or not statistics, but tagging on how people use the content. The number of points that are available because I have no assessments, there are no 
zero. Um, the number of questions, which are zero, the number of randomized questions available if you actually have it pooled, uh, and then that's fine and dandy. These are the properties that we already went through uh, before. You have a control panel, uh, and this control panel tells you how the students interact with that assignment. Uh, so one is that major circuit breaker in order to open and close it. But this one here basically says, do you want to share the scores? So no, and this is typically what you do after the class, after these, the problem is, is closed, although you can certainly open it up right there and, and the students would then get the score that they have available and also get this, um, yeah, get the scores that are available. You can then say that you want the solutions to be available, those PDFs that I have connected off of it. Now, the, some of the technologies have solution capabilities in the technology itself, but the ability to have the PDF with this full expanded discussion off of here is what this is discussing. You have the ability to share the statistics. So you can say, if you want the students to know the standard deviation, this, the mean, the histogram of it, their Z-score compared to those things. Uh, in some cases, that may be useful. In other cases, it may not be. That solves a lot of issues with questions than asking, how did they perform compared to the, the class? We basically teach them, if your Z-score is greater than one, you did pretty well. If it's less than one, minus one, you didn't do quite so well. Um, in there. If you're not familiar with Z-scores, I can go over that uh, at a later time. Uh, and then if you want to do a breakdown uh, so the students can see how many questions are there and, what the and what's connected. That is useful, for example, when I do provide an exam um, uh, beforehand. I don't want them to know necessarily how many questions they have available and what's the point breakdown associated with that beforehand. But in some cases for uh, homework, that's perfectly fine or an exercise of that. You have the ability in order to be able to do that. And there's going to be a handful of other things that are in, uh, that's going to be fleshed out on this control panel to address technology specific capabilities like the web work and the my open math and such um, h5p is a little bit less powerful so we have less control in order to be able to handle it externally so we have to modify things i'm almost done with this and then we'll start adding questions off of here we have a submission infrastructure um, uh, so we have no assessments and so i can't track on how students have evolved this is essentially um skip over that this has the ability of uh, providing greater access so I can say these graders have access to being able to grade this assignment um, or TAs. Uh, uh, statistics, if I want to be able to see statistics on here, which is not overly impressive because no one has done anything on that. I have two levels of grade books. Uh, we have the assignment grade book and the course grade book. The course grade book would be like what um, uh, a learning management system provides. So here are five problems and here's pro five examples. Here's a list of all the students that are there and here are, are all the things. And I, I, unfortunately, I don't have a fake class in order to show uh, fake names. Uh, and so hence, I can't show this uh, publicly to you for a class that has uh, enrollment without violating FERPA uh, for that. And then we have an assignment gradebook, which is typically not stored in a gradebook that at least most learning management systems provide that says what is each question and their performance off of those questions. And that gives us the ability to go in and modify a question grade for a student. And then that propagates into everything instead of trying to have to address it at a uh, assignment level. Okay, so let's add an assignment add an assessment uh, on here. So this is the assessment infrastructure. There are different ways in which we add assessments off here. One is uh, using the assignment remixer. One is doing a search by meta tags, and that is going through the uh, public repository of web work and my open math uh, databases. And one is a direct import by page ID. Uh, I don't want to go into that right now. I just want to focus on uh, the assignment remixer. The assignment remixer is called the remixer because it mirrors much of the capabilities of the OER remixer that you learned for your textbook. The idea behind it is that you have possible questions here and you have chosen questions here that you have added uh, to that. So let's say I want to uh, go through and find somebody's assignments uh, and start to master that. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to find my I'm going to show all. Am I doing this right? I'm not sure if I'm doing this right. Um, let's 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 go through my two uh, uh, C class, uh, and I'm going through an assignment. This this is a little uh, 
not ideal. So let's say I'm going through uh, and I like somebody's uh, assignment. Uh, so let's say I like, uh, where are we? Uh, I'm gonna go through the midterm. <clears throat> so I pulled up an assignment that's somewhere um, and I, I went through it in this way. I don't have to go through in this uh, all these things, but I, I picked it anyways. Uh, and it goes through a uh, my final exam last quarter. Uh, and my final exam had a bunch of web work questions. Some of them were true, false, some were uh, multiple choice. Uh, and then it had some open-ended questions that they had to go and write down their work and submit a PDF for, for grading. And then I had some mixture where the numbers that they got from their open-ended grading were submit were graded by web work. And then we had a secondary grading by the student in order to see if they get partial credit for the work that they have submitted. So the idea is to try to make this as streamlined and easy as possible for students in order to grade these things. But again, I think I had like 37 assessments or so on the, uh, the class. And I can come in here and I can basically take this assessment um, uh, and this this is the viewing of this question. So it's a, it's a standard electrochemical uh, true false question, fairly super simple. Um, in order to throw out there. Uh, and I can add the question and it throws it there. I can equally grab this one and drag it over here. Let me drag it up there um, and put it down there. I don't have the titles on here uh, yet. They're private titles uh, off here. Um, and I can just basically drag uh, just like I did before uh, these things in order to do it. The problem is that because these titles are not unique, it's a little hard to be able to see them organized. Uh, but this right here is essentially adding these questions into um, into my assignment. In this case here, the the, the lab. Um, and I'm not sure if this thing is even set up. It's even set up to give me real time feedback as an instructor to know what the answer is there. Um, that, that's that's there. Anyways, and I can remove the questions. So. Uh, it, what I would like you to do is to be able to find a, a, a problem set uh, that you like to be able to uh, parse through uh, using the remixer. Uh, then I'll go into tagging capabilities. So if you like, um, let me see if we have this thing set up yet. We don't. Uh, if you do a search through Larson, you can see all the courses that I have publicly available. Um, and so you can pick, for example, the OpenStax. So what we what I'm doing right now in my my uh, account is building collections, not proper courses, but collections of problems that are centered around specific books, like the OpenStax books, uh, or the Organic Chemistry Biological Emphasis book, uh, uh, or Introductory Spanish. So we're, we're being quite comprehensive here in order to be able to collect these things. These will be moved into a central commons. So you don't have to do a search on me. It's just right now it's centered on that. So you can go in and say, I'm gonna look at the OpenStax questions. And then you can select which section you want, uh, what chapter you want to do. Um, Let's say I chose gases and it pulls up the gases. And these are all the, the questions that were available uh, in OpenStax of, uh, textbook uh, that we have put in place. Some of them have been web worked, which means converted into auto grading. Some are still text that we are in the process of converting it to uh, auto grading. If the question is meant for auto grading, some questions are open ended that you then submit uh, an answer for. So now I can take this qu question here uh, which is just basically doing a conversion of pressure into um, into uh, better units than what we have there. And I can come in and say, uh, is this the same question? I can add that question and now it's over here. So uh, I like you find some questions that you, you would like to have available in order to populate your assignment. Um, you can choose OpenStax questions or you can grab one of the other OpenStax questions uh, or one of the other collections that we have right here that's under my name. It's best to use my name right now for that until we get into the commons. Um, you can also go through uh, and uh, I don't think Brian's course is publicly available uh, for us to be able to parse through his uh, his uh, collection of, uh, of H5P problems. Um, it's a pretty sure that that's not the case. So um, I think there's a question here. 
Was Brian the one that had that nutrition course? Yes. Oh uh, yeah, I found his problems. They're they're in there. You did. It's under yeah. If you go under course and do uh, intermediate nutrition. Oh okay yeah the the, the version that I was creating yeah the thing yeah it, it's it, it's still under me but it, uh, but it's uh, it, it's if you do any stru instructor it pops up. Yeah, but it's not it's it, it's not tagged to his instructor, so it's it's my version of his course um, uh, that that that's out there. So it, it, he also has his own stuff. Uh, it's the same version, same stuff, but it's hidden because it's not public, um, and I presume that's because of me and not because of him because he's a very sharing kind of guy. Um, so if you if you do that, you can then select uh, you know micronutrients, and now you can see. Uh, his micronutrients. This one here is an H5P problem. Uh, so it pulls up with H5P, which looks very similar to the web work problem, but not identical because it's a different technology. Uh, and then you can add that. So now uh, I have a assignment that has some web work uh, chemistry questions. I think these were my, ex my exam. There's a gas question from OpenStax. Uh, there's a, um, uh, an H5P problem from uh, Lynchfield, Lynchfield's um, thing. And you can just expand that to however uh, many that you want uh, that's out there. Uh, if it says restricted, now Brian just made his problem, his problems public. <laughs> so now you can see that. Uh, if it says, rest uh, I'm not sure, Maria, uh, what might say restricted. Um, you want to share your screen and see? Um, I'm no longer looking at it, but I was was looking at a lot of these. Is, I see the private title contact us, and then some of them it has hashtag restricted, and I'm not sure if I can follow find one at this moment because I already moved on. Oh, if you find it, we can uh, go about doing that. So let me. Um, uh, you can do tagging if the questions have tags already meta tags onto them. The vast majority of questions don't have good tags or any tags uh, that are on place that need to be added. So we are in the process of doing that to build it to an infrastructure uh, that's in place. And don't worry about direct uh, importing with page ID. That's how you import a question that you may write on a page that you just put the page number from your LibreText page into here and then it gets automatically embedded into it. Um, so uh, uh, we have uh, 12 minutes uh, before our break, um, let, let's take a look at what this, uh, please throw some questions my way if you have any more, and then I can, uh, I wanna transition, I wanna uh, uh, show a couple other things before we start to go about doing that. Um, I see a question from you, Frank, give me one, uh, one moment here. So I have the ability in order to, uh, to pull in, not just build a complete new assignment like that, which would be painful. Like for example, if I wanted to do an intermediate uh, nutrition class, I don't wanna build assignments in that way uh, if I just want to adopt Brian's uh, infrastructure. So I can go back to courses uh, and I can say, I want uh, to uh, import a course. Uh, and then in that course, I can, I can import Brian uh, Brian's course, and this is my version of that. There's no reason to do that. And I, uh, yes, I just want to make sure it's not conflicting because I, I have a version of it already in there. So I'm going to import the course. Uh, and now oh, it'll take a moment. It's going to make a new course up here. Um, and it is right here um, because it was put down there in, uh, in that direction. Uh, and I just I just created it uh, and it, it has all the chapters and all the sections that are available for, uh, for use. And then I can go in and start to modify it and say, I really don't like this question or that question. I can start to delete it. I can reorganize it and such like that. So it provides available when we have all these collections that you can come in and say, well, most of what, or I teach out of OpenStax book. And you can say, well, pull in the OpenStax book that then tracks the chapters and uh, exactly that you're using. And then you can select what you want to do and augment them uh, in order to be able to handle what you're, you're out there and doing. Um, I will... Uh, and you could do the same thing, not just with bringing in a chapter, uh, bringing in a, uh, 
um, a book, but you could also clone or import a assignment. For example, if I want to import an assignment from uh, Brian's book and I want to bring in this assignment. Uh, so assignment four from intermediate, and then I import it with properties and questions. Um, so if it's without the properties, it just basically has an unrelated. So now I have in the, my, my stat met class, a discussion uh, on uh, macronutrient uptake, which my students would especially enjoy uh, when we're learning uh, statistical mechanics. Um, so you have the ability again, import existing problems, exerce, import existing assignments, import existing courses. Uh, so that makes it convenient so that when you actually create a course for a specific campus, that new faculty members uh, or adjunct faculty members can quickly grab the, the solutions and run with it without having to go through the pain of building something uh, from scratch. There was uh, one, okay, so there's a question from Frank on here. Uh, Oh, is it now it moved? Okay, so yeah, it's very similar to learning management system. It is. Um, uh, uh, could you speak to why LibreText wanted? So uh, there are several reasons behind that. Uh, one is uh, we wanted to have an infrastructure that anybody can use uh, across the board, irrespective of whether you're registered in the class or more importantly, if your campus has paid for a learning management system for your campus. Now that in higher education is typically not the case, but there are many, uh, uh, K-12 campuses that do not uh, have learning management systems available and they're unable to capitalize on the power of what we have. Second, we want to have the ability in order to do more advanced features so we can actually embed these questions into our textbook, uh, which I'll be showing uh, afterwards um, uh, so that you can um, uh, you can embed them into your textbook, which is uh, on the Libre textbook, so that it does it becomes more advanced, and that's something that you can't get from a learning management system. S lastly, the uh, learning management system's native technologies is typically very remedial when it comes to questioning. Uh, it, it involves uh, what's called QTI. Uh, I can't remember what the, the acronym is described. It's a protocol, not necessarily a technology, uh, of handling very specific sorts of questions. Many of the questions I, sh actually all the questions I showed you here were fairly simple, but you can do very advanced sort of questioning infrastructure where you have uh, uh, things that require very algorithmic capabilities and moving things around and calculating and doing stuff like that, which no learning management system has the capability of doing uh, uh, from scratch. Um, and that also involves uh, implementing a, a, a learning tree uh, where you can actually, and this is again something we'll go to uh, afterwards, where you can then construct a learning tree uh, uh, where you're not giving a single question out. This one here is, is, uh, is should be modified. It, it, it was it was edited before a change was done. Um, or you have a learning tree where you have a question and you can allow students to go through different parts of the um, of remediation or tutoring in order to help to advance that. And there's lots of evidence that this sort of approach is immensely more powerful than a single question based approach. So we have the ability to do a lot more powerful things than just being able to deliver a single question out there. Um, and, and that's what we need to have control over uh, with the learning management system. Um, let's see here. The, um, so Sarah asked the question here, and feel free if you want to actually just repeat your question instead of having me read it, uh, because I have to sort of read and digest at the same time. Um, well, then I'll do that. Uh, so once we have something set up, can we import this into our own LMSs? especially for those of us who are at colleges that are we're required to use the LMS that our, our college is set up. Yes, we will. Um, it's rel So LTI is relatively straightforward in order to be able to, to embed these sort of things here. Right now, what we've tested is the gradebook infrastructure in order to be able to embed that. That being said, you can embed this into your book and embed your book into your learning management system. And then it already handles all that with a great book that comes in. But what many people want to do is to have it as native quizzing infrastructure in their, uh, their system. And it goes directly from their 
it goes to us and comes back out again uh, into these things. Each of these technologies, uh, H5P, WebWork, and MyOpenMap can be interfaced into the learning management system. They don't have the other aspects that I addressed in Frank's question uh, for, for augmenting it. Um, uh, but they oftentimes involve some sort of financial buy-in in order to be able to do that, uh, which your campus may or may not be able to do. For example, H5P typically is about $10 to $15 per student uh, uh, in order to be able to do that. Uh, web work uh, or uh, the two major commercial enterprises focusing on web work charges somewhere in the order of $40 a student per quarter. Uh, Lyrics uh, is something similar of, uh, up in Canada. Uh, uh, My Open Math is is free, um, but if you were to couple, if you were to use Lumen version of it, they would charge a lot because of the way that they are a commercial uh, enterprise off of it. Um, so it's all tied together into. Um, uh, I wouldn't say not for profit. It is not for profit, but we need to have a little bit of money in order to keep it afloat, but not anything close to that sort of level and comprehensive off of that. What I didn't mention, I did mention before, is that we can upload PDFs, we can upload text, and you can also record and, uh, and say, so that's capabilities that you don't have off of that. And do the learning analytics infrastructure behind these things in order to guide uh, uh, your pedagogy and your efficacy studies off of that. And that's exceedingly important. Uh, and learning management systems typically don't have those sort of capabilities. They then go out to other vendors to do that, if, if at all. Um, so Sarah, OK, that was Sarah's question. Deep, yeah, deep integration. Marie, when I attempt to import a course, I get an error message. Um, um, Marie, how about we, uh, after in five minutes when we have a little break, if you're if you're willing to show me, I'd, I'd love to take a look and see what the issue that you have there. Uh, Sarah, uh, let's see here. How do you import incorporate the IMath AS? It's in query. Uh, yes. So the uh, in order to embed anything in query. So let's say you're going to an assignment, and you want to add a. Um, uh, we're at an assessment uh, off of here. You could do a tag and do a search. So all of, uh, all of, uh, not all, but many of the problems in uh, IMath AS, which is, you know, my open math uh, has tagging. So if you were to do something like, uh, you know, these are tags that they have. So you did something like calculation, it will do a search through the database and give you all the questions that's available. This one here is a web work question. This one here is also a web work question. I'm looking for a question that might be, uh, that, oh, oh, that's interesting. Uh, Well, it looks like, yeah, you're, you've yeah, got yeah. multiple so I'm, I'm cubelining the tags uh, off of there. Um, the, I'm not entirely sure. These are supposed to be tags that come up. This is web work. And this web work. So that's not, not so great. Um, the, uh, if you find the question in the query library, where you go to the query library and you go to, the community gallery, and you select on IMath AS, you can then go and search through and find questions this way. This is a semantic uh, uh, perspective on that. We're going to improve our searching infrastructure. And you can say, I want gas laws. And they basically have code numbering on here and say, this is a question that you want. This, again, is using IMath AS. And this is the code. So each question has a code on here that's our code. And that's the page number. If you just copy that, to control C um, and then direct by page import. I just basically um, paste it in. It's a query library. And now I've, I've imported it directly into my library. Uh, so the idea behind that was that the, li the query library provided a mechanism for you to parse through and find the question you want. And then you plug it into here instead of doing a searching infrastructure and then being able to pull up off of that thing. Um, so uh, Maria grabbed that. How do you incorporate? Is that uh, it's a query? Uh, I'm, I'm, I want to be able to uh, 
make the searching infrastructure in ADAPT to be just as effective as a semantic uh, perspective of viewing or finding questions in a query, irrespective of what, whether it's my open, whether it's IMATH, AS, or it's uh, web work. Um, and, and because the questions that we have, the way the, the database is used in this way is a, a massive underutilization of the power of this library. Um, we can actually do something much bigger and much better behind it. Um, but we need to go through the problems and, and, and add the appropriate meta tags to make it effective in order to be able to uh, use. Um, I will talk about uh, the learning trees afterwards, but yes, it, we use it in the same way um, when we build the tree. That will be in the advanced thing after the break. Um, uh, I actually know very little about my wall map versus my open math. I was under the understanding that they were essentially the same database infrastructure, just different branding front ends. But it sounds like Sarah is saying that they are, they have different capabilities. I sent an email to David Lippman last night just because he responded to me about uh, alternate texts and in regards to uh, uh, um, bringing in the collection. I even mentioned uh, wall map to him in regards to that. Um, and I haven't checked my emails in the last uh, two hours to see if he's actually responded. So Delmar, what I understand the difference is, um, is that WAMAP is clearly for Washington State, but it's allowed faculty to build their own questions, um, kind of like the sandbox in LibreText. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge pool compared to my open math because my open math is strictly um, the questions that are within the OER textbooks. Um, but most, at least that's what I've been told by David. I mean, that could be wrong. So I just found it a lot more difficult to find unique questions that I was looking for for my class. Um, everyone has the option still to privatize their questions in WallMap. So if if you are worried about like the Creative Commons licensing, it seems like there would be a way for David to just like only provide the pool that is Creative Commons licensed and open, you know, not set to private. Yeah, that, that, that's what he did when we uh, when he gave us the database for my open math about a year and a half to two years ago, um, and where he gave us the sort of open versions of the content. I know a lot of people in my open math create their own problems. Uh, that's an, uh, they're not connected directly to a textbook, although all the examples I could think of off the top of my head are <laughs> actually connected to an OER textbook, uh, oftentimes I, open stuff. Um, I, I have to say um, I discovered that by doing something I wasn't supposed to do, which was bringing in a whole course from WAMAP over to my open math. And he was like, uh, you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> so um, I learned the hard way. Well, that's uh, interesting. Anyways, yeah, um, maybe ask him and what, you, he, what, what the difference is, because there's a really good in, chance you'll end up with a lot more questions. Yeah, I, 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 I actually didn't know that. So I was really quite, uh, I mean, it's a new thing. Uh, um, well, anyways, I, I, I've started the conversation with David uh, uh, in terms of being able to do that. One of the things that David's technology does not do, and I'll stop uh, in a moment so we can actually take a break, uh, is that he did not develop a system in order to uh, download parts of the database in order to migrate. Uh, so it, if we grab one versus the other, we can't grab both and merge. So we have to do sort of a manual uh, course by course uh, uh, integration which sounds very painful and it could be, but then again, I also have a hundred undergraduate students that are doing uh, uh, lots of work. Uh, so that's the sort of thing that's well suited for them to be able to do uh, sort of a brute force solution to things when a more elegant solution is not available. So with that, let's take a 25 minute, now it's a 21 minute, when they make a 25, uh, 21 minute break and uh, I'll start slowly uh, and we'll get back at, uh, is it 12? Uh, what what time do we come back at uh, different time zones? Uh, hopefully Amber can actually uh, uh, chime in here. Yeah, um, we are scheduled to come back at 2.45. So in 20 minutes. Yep. Okay, 
Sorry, just not, not my time zone, so I need to think a little bit more. 15 minutes before the hour. Okay, so how about we do that? Uh, we might have a little bit of a slower introduction because I think I'm transitioning into the more advanced uh, feature uh, component of, uh, of ADAPT and like that. I encourage you to play around with that. Uh, uh, otherwise, we can actually continue the discussion uh, after uh, after the break um, and such. And again, uh, uh, Marie, if you wanted to show me the uh, the restricted thing, we can do that. If you want to take a break, which is understandable, uh, we can go over it at a later time. I'll just show you this really quick. Okay. Uh, how about we cancel the recording? Oh, 